Let us resume the public worship of God and let us sing praises to him in Psalm 139. Psalm 139, uh, singing verses 1 to 8. Five stanzas. O Lord, thou hast me searched and known. Thou knowest my sitting down and rising up. Yea, all my thoughts are far to thee are known, my footsteps and my lying down, thou compassest always. Thou also most entirely art acquaint with all my ways. For in my tongue, before I speak, not any word can be, but altogether lo, O Lord. It is well known to thee. Behind, before, thou hast beset and laid on me thine hand. Such knowledge is too strange for me, too high to understand. From thy spirit, whither shall I go? Or from thy presence fly, ascend thy heaven? Lo, thou art there, there if in hell. I lie. Verses 1 to 8. Five stanzas of Psalm 139. O Lord, thou hast me searched and known. <coughs> Yeah. 
God in prayer, stand and bow before Almighty One. O mighty, eternal, glorious, just, just and sovereign God, we will all one day stand before thee to give an account of ourselves unto God. We will remember this day, this night, we will remember last night, last year, and every year all will rise up before us. Oh, how can we stand? Who shall stand when thou dost try our reins? When thou dost examine and scrutinize our doings and our wantings, all our desires and uh, all the hidden shame of our lives. And yet we come, we have to come, we have to come Whatever thou dost know, where can we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. There is no other source for the salvation of our souls but in the one that thou hast provided for the worst of sinners. And uh, he is the one that each one of us must know must seek and must find and we bless thee that he has promised us that if we seek thee we shall find thee if we seek thee with all our hearts oh take away any other interest and desire but to know our Saviour for to know him is to know is to have life eternal and uh, without him there is no nothing but shame and rebuke and uh, judgment and uh, banishment forever Oh, that men would see the choice that they're hastening to and while it is day would seek the only comfort in life and death the only hope for unworthy sinners and uh, take Christ as he's offered to us in the gospel there is no price to pay. He is freely offered and therefore open our hearts and awaken our desires that we will hasten to him. We will do nothing, do nothing to prevent our finding peace with God through the blood that was shed. We pray, O oh God, for anyone that we know who is still a stranger to Christ and for whom we have been praying that this day and even this night will be a time, the time, the accepted time, for now is the acceptable time. And we thank thee that Christ has his arms stretched out to us is saying, come, come unto me, I will give you rest. Oh, what love is here. When we think of the price that was paid, the Calvary that was endured, 
Hey, the blood that was shed, the body that was broken, the wounds that were endured, the nails that pierced, and the thorns, the whip that hey, lashed his body, the cross that burdened him, but above all the the wrestlings of his soul as he bore our sins on his body and on his soul. We thank thee, Lord, that he said, not as I will, but as thou wilt. We thank thee that he set his face as a flint. We thank thee that he was able to say, it is finished. We thank thee that having been buried and he rose again and is now ascended, he now looks down upon us from the highest of heaven and awaits each sinner find their way, each one chosen from eternity to bow before their Saviour, and acknowledge and confess him. We thank thee for those of us who know him. We pray that in the weeks to come we will follow faithfully, that we will bear fruit to his praise, that we will not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, because it is the power of God unto salvation. And we pray for thy worshipping people and confessing people throughout Scotland that we may be the salt of the earth and that uh, our lights will so shine that sin will be ashamed, these fearful sins that are evil written into law will uh, be repented of, they will be cast aside and forgotten in men's passion and desire to be righteous and holy and right with God. He bring near these days, Lord, these glorious end times when we shall uh, see the kingdom of God come with power, when we will see Satan taking flight, when we'll see sin hiding itself for shame. And when we will see an ingathering of young and old into the, uh, the, the, the shepherd's fold. And we pray for those uh, far afield for whom we have an interest. Remember France in these troubled times that our witness there will be like a refuge from the storm. And that a uh, uh, pastor Pierre will be wonderfully used and he will have great liberty in declaring Christ and those who help him. Paul and Fabienne will have great zeal and great encouragement in setting up new witnesses to the glory of Christ and that in Spain and in Portugal there will be a lengthening of the cords and a strengthening of the stakes, and that this will extend to Brazil and Mexico, where there are promising signs, and that in our church and in the States there will be an ever-growing appreciation of the great sovereign doctrines of grace and of the a worshiping according to the pure practice of the apostles, and that uh, so uh, the wickedness that seems to gain uh, and gain there will halt on its tracks and uh, will be discouraged and uh, divided and uh, dismayed uh, as, the, uh, as the chariot of Christ progresses through that land and into Canada. Remember our witness in Noblesford that it will be a mightily blessed and remember Smith's Falls in thy mercy. And Sri Lanka, Lord, prosper Parthipan and his colleagues as the Institute knew a new witness and uh, bless the work that uh, 
Reverend Tim McGlinder over there, that there'll be much fruit following, that there'll be no, seeming no end to the progress eh, of Christ in that dark island. We beseech thee also to prosper thy witness among thy suffering people. Eh, as we prayed this morning, that eh, where there are in great need and pain in India, Pakistan, and Afghanistan and these other places that we hear of and in Laos that there will be a, a wonderful breakthroughs, wonderful overthrowing of the wicked a, authorities that a, misuse their powers, that they will be a, brought into the dust and that Christ will reign. Now gather us in with thyself, open thy word to us, as we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We sing now in Psalm 32, verses 1 to 5. Oh, blessed is the man to whom is freely put all the transgression he hath done. Sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputeth not his sin, and in whose spirit there's no guile nor fraud is found therein. We'll sing verses one to five, six stanzas of Psalm 32. O oh, blessed is the man. O oh, blessed is the
Let's turn now to the Word of God and again to the Gospel of John and the last chapter, the 21st chapter of the Gospel of John. John chapter 21. Now after things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias and on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Galilee, sorry, of Canaan in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter says unto them, I go a fishing. They said unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately. And that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have you any meat? He answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it in for the multitude of fishes. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girded his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and had cast himself into the sea, and the other disciples came in the little ship, for they were not far from the land, but as it were two hundred cubits, dragging the net with fishes. As soon then as they were come to the land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land, full of great fishes, an hundred and fifty and three. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. None of the disciples does ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them, and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He says to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? <coughs> he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He says unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said to him, Lord, 
Thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When I was young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee, whether thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he says to him, Follow me. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following him, which also leaned on his breast at supper, and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus saith to him, If I will, that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went the saying abroad among the brethren that this disciple should not die. But Jesus said unto him, said not unto him, he shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? This is the disciple which testifieth of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. May God bless his word to us. We sing now in Psalm 41, beginning at verse 7 to the end. My haters joining against me, my, my hurt devise, mischief say they cleaves fast to him, he lieth and shall not rise, yea, even mine own familiar friend, on whom I did rely, who ate my bread, even he his heel against me lifted high. But Lord, be merciful to me, and up again may rise, raise that I may justly them requite according to their ways. And so on to the end of Psalm 41 from verse 7, my haters jointly whispering. I had a joy.
Let us turn to Luke chapter 22 and 22. And it says there, And truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto that man he is betrayed. And they've been going to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. Friends, you may have anticipated that I would turn to the Apostle Peter, who would seem to be the chiefest of the Apostles. Uh, we've been studying the Apostles' experience of the cross, uh, but Peter is another like his brother Andrew, who was not there to see the sufferings of the Saviour. That does not mean the cross did not loom large in his bitter experience at that time. And so I want to trace tonight a little bit of Peter's journey through the time of the cross and the lessons that it has for us. I want Peter to speak for himself, so to let's say, tonight. Um, and his record is maybe not what he would be proud of. There was a time when a new king was enthroned in Spain, I think it was King Ferdinand, and there was a tradition at the time of a new king that he would release a prisoner from the jail. So Ferdinand was taken to one of the major prisons and he was sitting at a table and before him a prisoners came for his view review and one after another they came to Ferdinand and said O oh, King you know I shouldn't be here at all I'm an innocent man I was wrongly accused there's been a big mistake here please release me because I should be a free man one after another pled their innocence, pled their innocence. And at last one man came up. He said to the king, O oh, king, I'm guilty. I did terrible things. I deserve to be here. I shouldn't get out at all. I should be here till I die. But please, will you have mercy? What did the king say? He said, get out of here, you wicked man. You shouldn't be here among all these innocent people. In other words, in his comical way, he said, you admit your sin. You're the only one that shouldn't be here. And perhaps that's the case a bit with Peter. It's his very open errors and mistakes that make him precious to us and deserving of our respect and fellowship. So let us listen to Peter tonight. This is what he says, four things. The first thing says, I was proud. Anyone here got any pride? Maybe you think no. Or rather you say, well, have to admit it is a problem. 
This is what Prophet is saying to us tonight. I was proud. He says, you know, I believed I was the best fisherman in Galilee. If there was a fish to be caught out there, you can depend upon it, I would find it. And so he came back after our night's fishing, not a fish to be found. There he was, after casting the nets again and again, uh, he had to start repairing his nets in hope that he'd have something for his family and something to sell the next time. There he was, a failure. Uh, but the, this prophet from Nazareth came along and asked to use his boat and um, the failed fisherman put out the boat and that boat became a very useful machine you could say instrument because it became a pulpit for the greatest preacher of all time and the people gathered in their multitudes to hear him and Peter listened to until it was time to finish and Jesus said as you know launch out into the deep Peter protested what's the use if I can't fish catch a fish nobody can but out of respect for this wonderful preacher, he said, well, it's a fool's errand, but I'll just do it for his sake. Out go the nets. Again, they feel the tug on the lines and the vibration of the fish struggling. He has to call for help. And he falls down in humiliation. His pride has been punctured. If somebody knows fishing better than he does. So we follow Jesus. And what wonderful words he heard. And what wonderful works. So much so that when Jesus sent out Peter and the others they were able to do miracles they preached it from town and town village to village peter felt wow i'm really quite an apostle here i must be the best apostle around and even when jesus was alone with them <clears throat> and he asked them who do you think i am it was Peter that had the answer. He said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. What a glorious discovery. I wonder how much you have discovered of Christ. How well do you know this Jesus tonight, friends? You say, I've been attending this church for many years, some all my life. I really know just about everything there is to know about the Bible and the Gospel and about Jesus. That's a bit like how Peter felt there in Matthew. And then Jesus began to say that he had to go and suffer many things and be crucified what happened Peter took him and began to rebuke him saying be it far from thee Lord this shall not be unto thee he was such a great apostle that he could even correct the master himself what do you think Jesus turned and said to Peter Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offence unto me. Thou savourest not 
the things that be of God, but those that be of men. What he was saying to Peter was, what you think is best about yourself, that's what disqualifies you. That's actually what hinders you. So you're not the best apostle after all. You're not as good as you think you are. We're all tempted to think that we're not too bad. But friends, in the sight of God, we're a lot worse than we even think of ourselves, the best apostle. And then there was that time, there was that time when Jesus was in the garden and uh, Judas and the high priests and the multitude of the Jews and uh, the high priest servants came to arrest Jesus. There's Peter. <clears throat> and he's got a sword. He's saying to himself, I'm the best. I'm the best defender and guardian, security guard that Jesus could have. If anybody can help him, I can help him. And so he took that wild swing with the sword and cut off the ear of the high priest's servant, Malchus. And Jesus reaches out his hand and <clears throat> repairs the work, the foolish work that Peter had done. He has to heal, he has to put back in place what Peter had so wildly done. Peter just didn't know, excuse me, he just didn't know what the right thing to do was at the right time. He totally miscalculated the situation and uh, Jesus had said those that wield the sword will perish with the sword he wasn't the best guard after all he was humiliated he was humiliated oh you see well he deserved that but friends that was all necessary progress for this apostle Peter. Have you discovered that? You can't be used by the Lord until you go through these humiliations. When you see that you're a pure failure on your own, anything you attempt in your own strength is of no use. To the master i was proud said peter but then the second thing peter has to say is this i was prostrate of course he was prostrate when he found that Peter, that jesus could provide fill the nets with fish when he couldn't he fell down and said, I'm a sinner. But there was worse to come. There was worse to come. Peter says, I was the worst friend that Jesus could have. He's learned a bit about pride. And he's saying, I was the worst. He would say like Paul, I am the chiefest of sinners. He says, look at this. There in the Garden of Eden, sorry, Garden of Gethsemane, when, when Jesus was praying to his father and was in that extremity of need, was I there? Was I there praying? Did he not say to me, watch and pray did he not come back twice and say watch 
and pray. And what happened? I was sound asleep. I was the worst friend. And so because of that lack of prayer, when I followed him there to the high priest's palace, and I was by the fire, and that girl came up and said, you're one of them. You know this, I was ashamed to admit I was a friend of Jesus. I who thought I was the great apostle, I was ashamed of him. Friends, are you any better than Peter? How often have you kept quiet when you could have spoken? How often have you said nothing when the enemies of Jesus were blaspheming? You could have spoken a word. How often have you written a letter to the parliament to say, this is not right, what you're doing? You're not honoring the King of Kings. Where is your fear of God? When you saw these people breaking the Sabbath, did you speak to them and say, do you know what you're doing? This is God's day. You were ashamed. You can join Peter. You're not a friend of Jesus, are you? Jesus said, I was the worst friend. Then he says, you know this, I was the worst disciple. I was the worst disciple, why? I wouldn't learn my lesson. After all these failures, when I was there in the upper room at the Last Supper, Jesus said, one of you shall betray me. And I said, I will never betray you. Though all men betray thee, there I will never, never betray thee. That's the very thing I did. All these protests were based on my own vain opinion of myself. What kind of disciple is that? What kind of disciple are you, friend? How often have you to learn the lessons of discipleship again and again? How often do you repeat your failures. How often do these besetting sins hinder you? How often have you heard the gospel, friend? You still haven't come to Jesus. You just won't take that step. It won't last forever. The time will come when the opportunities are over. This might be the last time tonight. And the invitation is there. Come to me. Whosoever believeth, whosoever believeth hath everlasting life. And Peter says, here's another thing. I was the worst example. I was the worst example. None of the other disciples did what I did. None of them denied the Lord. None of them ended up cursing just to save their own skins. That's when I collapsed. When I realized I didn't deserve to be a disciple. I had disqualified myself after three years of training was the best of teachers. Here I was at an end of myself, an utter disgrace and an utter failure. Is that the end of the story? I was proud. I was prostrate. The Lord brought me down. I couldn't go any lower. 
that's where I found penitence. While my Saviour was dying there, he was working his work in my soul. First of all, while he was there in the high priest's palace, being tormented and tried by these false accusers, I went out racked with sobs, a broken man, <clears throat> a broken man. I couldn't help my saviour. I couldn't raise a protest. I knew they were false witnesses. I could have contradicted all that. All I could do was weep bitter tears. But I was a penitent. I was so sorry I loved my master. It's the last thing I wanted to do. I disappointed and failed the one who was worthy of my sacrifice, of my love, of my service, of my protest, of my dying for him. Here I was, saving my own skin. I was racked with sobs. My heart was broken. I was racked with sobs. Here's another sign that I was penitent. Something had started to work in me. I didn't run away like, like um, Judas of Iscariot and throw myself over the cliff. Although that's what could have been expected, I took myself back to the upper room. That upper room where the Saviour had washed my feet. That upper room where he had taught us about his departure and where he'd said, it is needful that I go away but I will send the comforter to you. All you need will be provided. I need to go, I'm preparing a place for you. And I will come again and receive you to myself. There I heard him pray to the Father, what a prayer. Father, I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work. Thou gavest me to do, I heard all that. That's where I went. What took me back there? Oh, that love for my Saviour could only take me back to that place of memories. It's the only place I could go. Despite my broken heart, I could only go there and there they were. The men that ran away in Gethsemane they were back there in that holy sanctuary. That's where we went in penitence, in dejection and failure. Friends, will you not go to that upper room tonight? Isn't that your place? Isn't that where you want to be? Don't you want to hear these words? But he says, if ye love me, keep my commandments. He says, no greater love for the man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Go there, friends. Find his love. Return. I returned to the upper room. And there we were when our dear master bled for us. On that cruel Calvary cross. There he bore our sins. There he was wounded for our transgressions. There he was bruised for my iniquities. There the chastisement of my peace was laid on him. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to our own way. 
But the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Are you listening to Peter? Are you listening to Isaiah? Are you listening to God's truth? Are you in that upper room tonight? Because if you are, the time will come. That came for Peter. Somebody broke in in the morning and said, the grave is empty. Peter jumped up and ran with John. He ran. He ran. He ran through the streets. He ran out the gate. He ran to that place, that garden close to the Golgotha. It's the nearest he got to the cross. He ran into the tomb but there was no Jesus there was no Jesus I thought I would find him I thought I would find him here he's gone he's left me behind there was Peter God is bringing him down to his nothingness but stirring up that passion of love for his precious saviour. Yet he didn't find him. But Jesus found him. It was only a few hours later. When they were going over these things, shut in for fear of the Jews, and through the door, the shut door, came that figure, that glorious figure, with his nail-pierced hands and his wounded side. And he said to them, Shalom, peace. Rest your anxious hearts. Peace has been made. Peace is declared. Pardon is declared for guilty sinners, for guilty disciples, for guilty apostles. It's only peace. There is no accusation. There is no judgment. You are justified freely by his grace. Are you a penitent, my friends? That's what Peter wants you to know. I was a penitent. And then there's this. Peter said, I was prepared. I had to go through a process. Yes, this was all part. This was all perfectly planned and designed to make me what I am. A tool in the hands of the mighty carpenter to build his church. I was prepared. How could he be prepared in that broken state he was a broken down man we would call it today a nervous breakdown he was just a shadow of his former self but you see god had broken down that old proud peter it was no longer there that was the process have you ever been brought down to that place where you despair of yourself. Well, from there, we read here in this chapter how Jesus put him together again. He put him together again. Just as he'd betrayed three times, so Jesus asked for a confession three times. And that confession repaired and remade that broken man. The first confession required was this. Jesus said to him, Simon, son of Jonas, he didn't even call him his apost apostolic name. He went back to that previous name, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? What is Jesus asking? 
He's saying, Simon, I want you to measure your love. Measure your love for me. Compare it with other things and other people. Can you measure your love? And then tell me truly the answer. And Peter can say this. He says, Master, thou knowest, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Is that question coming to you today? Will you measure your love? How high up is it on the gauge? <clears throat> Jesus knows. Measure your love. And when Jesus gets the reply, Peter uses a different word for love. Jesus is asking, do you agape me? That's a heavenly, spiritual love. You know this? Peter just answers with filio, the word, the ordinary word for love. He doesn't feel capable of expressing that heavenly love. You see, he's a broken man. <clears throat> and he has to start from down there with no confidence in himself. And yet, when he looks at himself, he says, I do love. But it's not the love that's needed. Only this, Jesus says to him, feed my lambs. Can you be a shepherd, friends, those who are shepherds here? Can you be a shepherd if you only feed lambs? Oh, it's useful, but it doesn't make a shepherd. You're not a fool shepherd if all you can do is feed lambs. There's more work to a shepherd than that. So Jesus is humbling Peter again. He's saying, Peter, look, you don't really measure up to the standard needed, but just start here. Make a start. Maybe you're like that. You say, well, I, I don't think I could do much. Jesus will start. He'll give you something simple to do. Can you lead in prayer in the prayer meeting? Can you speak to a child about the Savior? To start with something little. That's what Jesus wants. He just wants an indication of your love. Don't aim for the highest. And then there will come the second requirement. Jesus came to him again and said again, Simon Peter, son of Jonas, do you agape me? Do you have that heavenly love? Peter just can't. He can't make himself say that. He looks back on all his failures. He says, although I love the Savior, I know I don't love him the way I should love him. And so he says, feel you again. Feel. But he's repeated his love. He's, you might say, <clears throat> confirmed his love because he's done something more. He's confessed a second time. And Peter, and Jesus says to Peter, he doesn't say actually feed my sheep, he says keep, keep my sheep. I'll give you a job looking after the sheep. I'm not calling you a shepherd yet, but you're, you can do more than the lambs now. You've actually got a ministry to your fellow to your fellow believers. You've got something to give. Friends, have you got something to give to your fellow Christians? Because you love Jesus. You love Jesus and you won't deny him. You love to confess him. That's why the third request comes from Jesus. He says to Simon Peter, lovest thou me? And we're told that Simon Peter was grieved to be asked a third time. 
It's the old Peter, something of the old Peter there. He still had to learn that Jesus knew better than him. But Jesus is so long-suffering, isn't he? That he allows Peter, he accepts Peter's third confession. Thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Peter says, I know who you are. You're that God of Psalm 139. You know me through and through. Excuse me. And so he makes this wonderful confession. He loves the master because not only is he his gracious and glorious saviour, he is Lord of lords. He is God of gods. He's made a complete confession. And so Jesus says, feed my sheep. Don't go back to these fishing nets. You failed at that. You're no longer a fisherman. You're a shepherd. You've started a new career from this hour. Friends, the Lord Jesus is calling you to this career, to feed the sheep, to serve the Lord with all your the love of your heart. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank thee for this loving Saviour. And he wants, if we know his love, then we will love him. Show us evermore to know thy love and to know thy glory so that our lives will be spent for Christ every moment of every day and we will confess to all and we'll say all who fear God come here I'll tell what he did for my soul we ask in Jesus name Amen we close by singing in Psalm 25 the Short meter version of the Sam version. At verse four, show me thy ways, O Lord. Thy pass, O teach thou me. Do thou lead me in thy truth, therein my teacher be. For thou art God that dost to me salvation send. And I upon thee all the day expecting do attend. Up to verse 10, six stanzas of Psalm 25. Show me thy ways, O Lord. Show me thy ways.
friends, uh, there'll be a usual congregational fellowship next door at uh, the close of this service. Then looking ahead, uh, God willing, the Thanksgiving service tomorrow at 11 a.m. And as I mentioned yesterday, the collection tomorrow will go towards our own mission work in Sri Lanka. Midweek prayer meeting on Wednesday at 7, services next door to stay as usual. I expect to be here for all these services. And likewise, Mr. Ross has asked me to intimate to put three friends at the prayer meeting. Wednesday at 7, the service is next Lord's Day, 11 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. And all of these are, as the Lord wills and appoints. Mr. Fraser. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit rest upon you now and ever. Amen.